James Monroe, the man who served as America's fifth president, was incredibly well qualified for that difficult job. Before being elected president, Monroe had served as an officer during the Revolutionary War, as a U.S. Senator, Minister to France, to Spain, and to Great Britain, Governor of Virginia, and both Secretary of State and Secretary of War during the War of 1812. James Monroe spent many happy days of his life here at Ash Lawn in the foothills of Virginia's Blue Ridge Mountains. Having this place made it easy for him to spend time next door at Monticello, the home of his good friend Thomas Jefferson, the third president of the United States, and visit Montpelier, the nearby home of another important friend, James Madison, America's fourth president, whose strong support had been essential in helping Monroe win the election of 1816. When James Monroe assumed the office of U.S. President in 1817, workmen in Washington, D.C. were still busy repairing the White House and other government buildings damaged by the British during the War of 1812. That year, there was trouble far to the south in the Spanish territory of East Florida. Here, U.S. troops led by future President Andrew Jackson were busy trying to defeat the Seminole Indians for harboring runaway slaves in their villages and for attacking American settlers just north of the border in Georgia. It was in response to the Seminole War that Secretary of State John Quincy Adams offered to buy East Florida from the Spanish. Spain accepted the offer, and in 1819, the adams onis Treaty was signed. Under this agreement, ownership of all the lands that now make up the state of Florida was transferred to the United States for a cost of only $5 million. But the adams onis Treaty was important for another reason because it defined a clear southern boundary between New Spain and U.S. territory west of the Mississippi River. In 1818, the year before the Treaty with Spain was signed, an agreement had been reached between the United States and Great Britain that established most of the U.S. boundary with British Canada. However, at the Oregon country, the name for the lands between the Rocky Mountains and the Pacific Ocean. No agreement was made and the boundary ended. Britain and the United States agreed to share access to the Oregon country. People of each nation would be free to trade and settle here until the boundary could be decided. Of course, as was typical of that era, little importance was attached to how the Native Americans of the region would be affected after white settlers started displacing them from their ancient homelands. However, as a result of this agreement, the United States moved a little bit closer to becoming a nation that spanned the entire continent. As America's new boundary lines were being drawn during the presidency of James Monroe, the nation's population reached 10 million. During this period of explosive growth, new states were being added almost every year, and the issue of slavery increasingly divided the nation. Mississippi was added to the Union in 1817 as a slave state, meaning a state in which slavery was legal. The next year, Illinois was added as a free state, meaning a state in which slavery was banned. And in 1819, Alabama was added as a slave state. At that point, the number of free and slave states was equal. However, the application by Missouri for statehood as a slave state threatened to upset this balance unless the U.S. Congress took decisive action. The leaders of the northern free states claimed Congress had the right to prohibit slavery in Missouri as well as any other new states created west of the Mississippi River. But the leaders of the southern slave states strongly resisted this notion. They feared that if the balance of power was shifted in favor of the free states, slavery might be made illegal and undermine the South's slave-based economy. In 1820, 
Congressman Henry Clay of Kentucky helped enact a law called the Missouri Compromise, designed to appease both sides. This law allowed Missouri to be admitted as a slave state, but it banned slavery from the entire region north of the Missouri Compromise Line that corresponded to its southern boundary. It is interesting to note that while the Missouri Compromise was being worked out, voters in the state of Massachusetts decided to create a new free state from northern lands that had been a part of Massachusetts since early colonial times so that when the state of Maine entered the Union in 1820, it balanced the influence of the new slave state of Missouri when it became a state the next year. In 1821, the same year that Missouri became America's 24th state, Mexico was granted independence from Spain. And just as soon as Spain's long-time restrictions on foreign imports were lifted, a new trade route called the Santa Fe Trail was established between the town of Independence in Missouri and Mexico's old city of Santa Fe, 780 miles or 1,260 kilometers to the west. After that, every year for the next 20 years, about 80 American wagons filled with manufactured goods would make the long and difficult journey to Santa Fe, returning along the same route with Mexican gold, silver, furs, and mules. The traders would always stop here at the remote fur trading outpost known as Bent's Fort, which back then lay just across the Arkansas River from Mexico in what is today the state of Colorado. For Bent's Fort was the only place people traveling on the Santa Fe Trail could purchase needed supplies and have their wagons repaired. During the first quarter of the 19th century, besides Mexico, almost every other important colony in Latin America gained independence from its mother country in Europe. However, as this occurred, certain powerful monarchies in Europe threatened to stamp out representative governments if they developed in the old colonies. That was the reason that in 1823, President James Monroe issued his now famous policy statement called the Monroe Doctrine. In it, Monroe warned the European powers that he would consider any attempt on their part to extend their system to any portion of this hemisphere as dangerous to our peace and safety. In other words, the Monroe Doctrine warned the European monarchies that they could expect a strong response from the United States if they interfered with the affairs of any independent nation in North or South America. The ideas spelled out in the Monroe Doctrine were very important and continue to shape American foreign policy to this very day. The ideas set forth in the Monroe Doctrine were actually first proposed by Monroe's Secretary of State, John Quincy Adams. He was the son of second president John Adams and a man who on his own had accomplished a tremendous amount in the United States government. However, in the four-way presidential election of 1824, candidate Andrew Jackson beat Adams in the popular vote and even received 15 more electoral votes than Adams. Even at that, Jackson still did not have enough electoral votes to be declared the official winner and the House of Representatives had to decide the contest. After the fourth place candidate, Henry Clay, threw his support to Adams, the House declared Adams the winner. Many Americans were outraged by their decision, but under the law, the way John Quincy Adams became the sixth U.S. president was perfectly legal. In 1825, the year Adams took office, Great Britain made a bold move to bolster its claim to the Oregon country. Just to the west of here, along the Columbia River, Britain's Hudson's Bay Company began to construct a huge fur trading outpost where today's city of Vancouver, Washington stands. When it was done, Fort Vancouver was a sprawling compound that bustled with activity. It was comprised of big warehouses, a hospital, a store, 
workshops and dwellings. The fort was visited regularly by ocean-going ships. It rapidly became the center of trade and civilization for the region, and it played a key role in the later white settlement of the Oregon country. President John Quincy Adams was a firm believer in what was called the American system. This was a plan first instituted by Republicans in Congress in 1816. It required the federal government to take certain bold steps to make the United States a stronger nation. A key part of this plan was to have the government make important improvements in the nation's transportation system. One of these improvements was the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal, seen here. When President John Quincy Adams broke ground for this canal on July 4, 1828, it was envisioned as a great national project that would increase the speed that materials could be transported between the Atlantic seaboard and the nation's interior. It connected Washington, D.C. and the great national road that began at Cumberland, Maryland, which at that time was the country's main route to the West. For many years, a steady stream of barge traffic loaded with valuable cargoes such as grain and coal moved up and down the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal. However, by the time it was completed in 1850, the use of canals for transportation was already being supplanted by much faster steam-powered railroads, and the canal was rapidly becoming obsolete. The same year construction began on the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal, Congress took another bold step intended to promote the nation's well-being when it passed a very high tariff or tax on imported goods. The tariff was enacted to protect the factories of New England from overseas competition by making foreign products more expensive than their American counterparts. But the owners of southern slave plantations hated it. They called it the Tariff of Abominations, abomination being a word that means disgusting or loathsome. The reason they hated it was that a large percentage of southern agricultural products, mainly cotton, was sold overseas. In payment, instead of money, they often received finished goods, such as woven cloth, and the tariff on these goods was a major expense. Southerners believed that the owners of northern factories were growing richer at their expense. They also thought that by imposing the tariff, the federal government was interfering with their rights. Besides that, many white Southerners were beginning to fear that the government might also try to outlaw slavery itself, and that was something they would not tolerate. And so, with the tariff of abominations tearing away at the fabric of national unity, another election was held in which Andrew Jackson soundly defeated John Quincy Adams for the job of President of the United States. And with that, a new era in American history began. True or false, the Monroe Doctrine placed high tariffs on foreign goods True or false, Fort Vancouver was located on the Ohio River. True or false, the Santa Fe Trail opened after Mexico gained independence from Spain. True or false, John Quincy Adams became president after winning a very small majority of the popular vote. True or false, the Tariff of Abominations helped improve national unity in the United States. <laughs>